intro. So welcome, everybody. This is our uh, regular meetup time. Today's uh, the 19th of November, 2024. And today we're doing a, a bit of a code review and talking about the Opulent Voice implementation or minimum shift keying uh, modulation scheme for uh, the target is the Pluto SDR. And I will turn it over uh, to, to Matthew to, to lead us today. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I was, you know, we've been struggling, I guess, a little bit with the uh, the um, Costas loops and the uh, MSK demodulator. So I thought it'd be worthwhile to uh, spend a few minutes or a little bit of while um, looking at the, the code. Um, and I think before we jump into that, um, I just want to give some context to um, what we're talking about. So I'll go ahead and share. And um, okay, so hopefully we can see. So I'm going to start with um, all those little panels in my way. So we'll start with this diagram here. This 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 is the Massey paper, and in here they have uh, this little demodulator circuit here, and and this is actually what is included in the demodulator. This is just a portion of the Costa Sloop. It's not the entire Costa Sloop. Um, we, we'll look at the Costa Sloop in a moment, but you can look at these are these the upper and the lower. Um, the upper you might uh, we can equate it to F1 path, and the lower is the F2 path uh, in our design. And so this is just the um, decoder, the data decoder portion, but it also is the I path, if you will, of, of the Costa Sloop. So we're taking the input signal, we're multiplying it by F1 here at the top, uh, PT or F2 at the bottom, QT. We're integrating over one bit period. Um, and then we have a signal out, and then <laughs> there's a, a little multiplier here. The A is always one, so that multiplier doesn't really exist, and the B, is alternating one minus one uh, on every clock. And then we go through a unit delay and we add the unit delay in the pre in the in the current value and the in the delayed value on both ends. Uh, and then we compare them and we get the bit output. So you know this is the basic demodulator that we're using. Um, there's a little bit of magic to the B here. But uh, we can just um, let that be for the time being. <laughs> um, so this is the Sweden Hodgegart paper, and so this is basically this is the, the modulator we have implemented. Again, the I portion here we have uh, uh, you know we have the signal generator up here, and and then it goes. Uh, and gets mixes the input signal. Um, and so if we look at, we could call the top F1 and the bottom F2 again. And so for the F1 path, the, the signal is going to be generated at F1, and then it's going to mix um, with the cosine and with the sine on the top. And again, we integrate, right? So that what we just looked at in the Massey paper, there's an integration, and then um, we dump every... Uh, T, which is the bit period, and then we delay by T, and then we do the adding, just like we did there. Um, so th this path here is the same as we just looked at, and then um, again, we, we we sum those, we do a little thing here. So it is, the decoder here is just a tiny, tiny bit different, but up until this DMOD zero signal, everything is identical. Um, and so what we're adding now is the the cube terms up here in the very top and the very bottom. And so again, we're, we're accumulating for a bit period and then we dump it and we delay another bit period and then we, we mix here. Now, th this is an interesting thing. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of hand wave the, the theory here a little bit. What, what's happening here in the upper Accumulator, it, it's really a, um, we call it, it's an accumulation or an integration, but it's also a correlator in that um, the, the signal coming in, if it's correlating, we're going to collect energy here. And if it's not correlating, we should be collecting, no, we should be collecting uh, 
no energy, right? Or um, ideally, or but it's going to be a smaller number than if we're collect if they're correlating. Um, and we're doing it at the bottom. But what's happening here then? Oh, oh, well, the point I wanted to make is so the output of this integrator uh, is, is the true. Is, it's the error signal, and the math basically, if you if you go and do the math when you're taking the sine times the signal, the output is a sine theta, where theta is the the phase offset from from the ideal. So th this um, after the mix, it's the sine theta. And then there's also a, a another frequency component that's um, because the mixer gives F1 or plus or F1 minus. Um, so so there's another image there, but we're kind of just ignoring it. It's kind of just noise that's writing up on top, but it's it it kind of goes away with the accumulation kind of. Um, so basically, the output of the accumulator is a is a gained error signal. Um, and we're not really doing anything else with the error, but what what in MSK the input signal, even though it's the same frequency, the phase could be either zero or 180. So it's either a plus one phase or a minus one phase. And so the error signal coming out will be a positive sign or a negative sign, depending on the phase of the signal. And but that's not a very good error signal in that it's not consistently. Like if the frequency is high, say it should always be positive. If the frequency is low, it should always be negative, right? So what's happening here is after the the data bit accumulation on on this lower path, we're just slicing it, and so it's basically the output of this the slicer is uh, a single bit, and it's really just the sine bit of this data that uh, is a one or a minus one. And it gets multiplied to the error signal, and this normalizes the sign of the error signal. So now the error signal will always be positive for a positive frequency offset, or always be negative for a negative frequency offset. And then um, we take that normalized error signal, and it goes through a filter of some sort, and then adjusts the um, the the frequency generator. And so again, this is this is you know, what we've implemented in our design. Um, any any questions so far on this, on the theory of what's happening here? I think the only question that I can come up with is to um, to reduce the, the noise that we're kind of dealing with. That's the other image, right? Yeah, so again, so your signal coming in, say it's F1, right? We mix it with this F one. You're going to you're going to basically, but but F two is well not F two still there. But you're you're getting when you mix you get the um, the yellow plus the signal and the yellow minus the signal right. So um, one of them is basically coming down to baseband. We're zeroing out the input right, uh, or it should be zero. Assuming it's frequency locked, then you just have a phase offset. So that's your that's the signal you want but on top of that then is this signal that's that's the yellow plus f1 so at some higher frequency you have this this sine wave writing on top of that right now um so th this was my motivation for putting in the low pass filter that that is there so that we can kind of get rid of that sine wave but you know in this paper you know they don't care about the sine wave they're not doing anything about it yeah, um, it's like maybe they know something. Maybe well, I think I think the out. sine wave the sine wave should be mean zero, right? Um, so I mean, it doesn't. I don't think it contributes anything meaningful, in it, right? Where it does, though, a little bit is if your frequency is offset off a little bit, then when it ends, it's not. You know, if it's say it started at zero, if it was perfectly aligned, it's the sine wave will start at zero at the beginning of the bit period and end at zero at the end of the bit period. And so it's it's basically you're accumulating it, but you're accumulating a sine wave, you know, uh, from over that bit period. It's going to be mean zero. So there's okay. there's no contribution, right? Right. But when the but you know if your if your sine wave doesn't start at zero or it doesn't end at zero, it'll add a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's it's fairly small, right? Because it's it's you're you're not accumulating 
you know, the whole bit period worth of that, you're only, like, you only have whatever the offset was at the beginning and end. And even those, I guess, should really cancel each other out. Uh, but I mean, they're, they're, it's a really tiny contribution. So in, in the end, I don't think it matters. And, and in the simulation, you know, if I, if we basically bypass the low pass filter with an alpha of zero, it, it doesn't really change the, change anything. So okay. I, I, I think it, I think that, that other frequency component is irrelevant from from the best I can tell. Maybe maybe there's something I'm missing there. Okay. Yeah, I think it I think it should work out if there's something we should probably like just keep an eye on it. There's something in the implementation if we pick frequencies where this is a an issue. Just uh right. just keep it keep it in mind. But yeah, I I I see I, I see what you're explaining. It 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 should not be a problem right right so i'm gonna go to another paper so this is the hogart shoons and again um we see this um this is the same again demodulator that we see in in the massey paper um and then the here's the the costas loop so this in the figure six and it's basically the same. This is one of the two coastal sloops. Uh, so you R1 T or R2 T, depending on if it's F1 or F2. So again, it's implementing pretty much the same thing that, that we have. So you know, we we so three these three papers are in agreement or consistent, and you know, this is this is what we've we've tried to implement. And then um, I didn't look at it in the other paper, but then. So th this is just the um, figure six is showing the synchronization, the, the, the bit time uh, or the frequency locking of the Costas loop. So the Costas loops are locking to F1 and F2 to that, to that frequency, right? Um, and then coming out of that, we're going to decode the bits, which isn't really being shown here. But the other thing, the other component then is we need the, the bit times, the clock recovery. So the the figure six is the carrier recovery. Figure seven is the is the bit time or timing loop, uh, timing recovery. And but it, it's really just a um, it, it's just a mixing of the frequency locked, phase locked R one and R two. So in the figure six. Coming out of the, of the little signal generator, this little signal generator has been locked to the incoming signal. So we've adjusted the R1 output or R2 output to match the R signal coming in. And so in the in figure seven, we're taking that adjusted R1 and the adjusted R2, and we're doing some math here, and out comes a, uh, a DN clock and a CN clock. And so these are basic, they're they're the same frequency. They're just uh, quadrature. Uh, they're offset 90 degrees from each other, but they are. Um, so they're, they're, these are basically defined in our bit times. or they're two, they, they actually define two, the two bit times, uh, twice the bit time. Um, so you know, if it's high, the high pulse is, is one bit time and low pulse is, enough, is a, another bit time. So there's not. Yeah. Another... Yeah. I think this is, this is where we had that discussion where, uh, uh, there's a set of papers that are working on um, two two times the the bit rates or bit rates. Um, you know, each each individual bit is the bit rate, right? But the there's right. a bunch of papers that that deal with demodulation, decoding, and recovery with a, a two times this bit period. And but we're attacking it from the from the set of papers that are looking at at bit time, like down to the, to the bit time, but the right. clock recovery will return a two times the, or a two times this bit time. And then we have to divide it down one more time in order to use it for the, for the particular implementation that we're after. More or less. Yes. Um, what, what's interesting though, the CN, right. Uh, again, it's high for one bit, low for one bit. And, and so remember on the modulator, we had that B bit, that's, yeah, that's being mul uh, multiplying by one or minus one. The CN is used to reverse that. So again, if we if we just take a quick look up here at this demodulator, the CN 
which is that clock we just recovered, is used to multiply or reverse that BN on the transmitter. So it, it actually, it's only used for this one purpose. So it's high for the one bit time and low for one bit time. And that's actually exactly what we want. Right. So that we're, we're multiplying one for one bit time and minus one for the next bit. Yeah. And then that, is that what we're seeing when we, on the processor side, when we recover the bit count from the register? Um, because I think that's what we're seeing is we're seeing that the bit count is actually reasonable some of the time and then unreasonable other times. So it, yeah, is it the case uh, where it's kind of losing track of this uh, this result from, you know, we're, we're we're running this this clock recovery all the time and we're returning this information and, you know, we're coming unmoored somewhere along the way. But is 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 this the like am I, my assumption is, is that the bit count is from the clock recovery. Exactly. And, and the clock recovery is from the F1, F2, from the carrier recovery, right? So yeah. if, if the Costas loop was way off, if this R1 signal in this diagram was um, was much larger or much smaller than was supposed to be, but let's say larger, so then this frequency is too high, right? Yeah. And then we come into this clock recovery logic that the bit clocks here or the two times bit clock will be way fast, will be much faster than it's supposed to be. And so, yeah, we're going to see the bit count be much higher than we expected. Because, it, yeah, we're, we're, we're basically clocking bits out based on, on this signal, on the DM. Yeah. So is it a clue but, that we're like, we're seeing like, we're seeing the correct number for a lot of the time and we do get zero error for these mm -hmm. stretches for some of these um, gain pairs for the, the gain in the loop. But then we see, we don't see like it go out of control and just like wander all over the place. We're seeing it only go to like um, 16 times the expected number and then another 2x over that. Like we're seeing these, these, these very particular results coming back from the bit count is that some sort of clue that can that we can use or yeah, or is I, that I think normal so, like it, is that is it just saturated out at these levels or it, it well that it gets a fixed level makes me think that it that is saturated so like if we look at the decision at the coastal loop again like the the accumulator here i have saturation logic on it, it and then in the pi controller there's saturation logic so if these really went way, way, way high for some reason, then, then it's going to hit a rail at, at the saturation. And so then this loop could just, you know, if it's stuck at that rail, it's going to be running at, at that speed. And it's a fairly constant speed, right? If it's at the rail and maybe, you know, we'd have to do some math and analysis, but maybe, you know, it would be maybe a good bet that it would, that would be, you know, 16 times or 32 times the expected bit rate. Um, it, when it's sitting on those rails okay I, I, so I, yes i think it's a clue i'm not sure we fully understand it but i, I yeah. mean i think that <laughs> yeah i, I, I guess think that, that, i was kind of like expecting like when we lost lock because i mean we're locking for some of the time for some of the pairs and it was really exciting to see and it matches and and good but like when it comes undone i guess i was expecting it to just like scribble all over the place but it doesn't it goes to these values and just stays there it's almost like a a stable yeah condition. or maybe it's a local minimum of some sort yeah um, yeah that, that that is good so it's getting a false lock and it's some local minimum that's not okay <laughs> yeah maybe i don't know if, if if anybody else has any uh ideas on this it'd be good to know um we'll keep we'll keep plugging away at it um but yeah, I guess I, I did. I kind of expected it like once it's out of lock, it just goes to some corner, you know, like it goes to its corner and just waits until it can yeah. get another. Well, you know, normally I would think normally my experience, but it, I mean, it depends right on 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 a number of things. But, you know, usually you just see him wandering around. Yeah. Yeah. That, it, yeah. It, wandering around like random walk through like I'm yeah. on board and everything. But it it we haven't seen. A lot of that like we can see where and then the code it's supposed to do this it's it's a 
So the processor side code is attempting lots and lots of get different gain pairs and we can do incrementing and we can do a random search. We can do a lot with trying to figure out, uh, you know, trying to like uh, test the space, but it, it doesn't wander around. It actually snaps to these, these behaviors, which makes me think that we've got a really solid design and we're not configuring it correctly. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you can kind of see here at the beginning of the simulation, right? Yeah, the, there you go. The, the, if you look at the p-value or the the LPF adjust, which is the output that goes to the NCO, they're they're kind of wandering around a little bit, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it, it'll lock, and and yeah. it's not that that the, 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 the signal's perfect, right? But it, it's it's staying within a certain range yeah. for the remainder of the simulation, and then you can see the I accumulator has was growing. And then it, it just went flat as well. Yeah. You know, so th this is, you know, a stable point here in the simulation where, you know, we, yeah, from here on out, everything's happy. Right. But yeah, it's just kind of wandering around here up until that point that it, it catches and, and blocks. Yeah. And so in, in other simulations where the loop's not locking, I'll just see it wander around. I've never see it. I've never seen it go to, well, not that I recall. I've not recall having seen it like go up to a, a rail and and get stuck there. Um, I, I generally just see it wandering around uh, and not make not doing anything. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe Paul, if you want to pick one of the recent um, visualizations of what we're talking about to kind of show the behavior, um, because the simulation uh, of the, this is the same circuit, so. This is the uh, a picture of the simulation of it, um, you know, mathematical simulation. And and then when we implement it and we deploy it to the Pluto and then we write some code and there's lots of additional complexities and everything in in an actual deployment. So what we're doing is we're trying to 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 get the same results that we see in simulation, and we're we're seeing uh, some some very different behavior. Um, so if 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 Paul, you can pick one of your visualizations and and share it. That'd be that'd be cool because then we could show, uh, you know, what we're what we're kind of encountering in the lab. So our goal is to kind of get the the simulation, which is working and and looks good, and the and the deployment to come together. Um, and we also did did some work to try to to fill in the gaps on our theoretical understanding and and to try to then say, okay, instead of just kind of guessing on the gain pairs, on the proportional and integral gain pairs and doing a search, a brute force search, why don't we step back and look at what we're trying to accomplish and then um, and then name them, like what is the proportional and integral gain that should work for the system that we have? Uh, and for those of you saying, wow, we should have done this in the first place. Okay, yes, but... but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, we're 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 getting there. Uh, but well, anyway, and we did try. I mean, uh, um, Jeremy, oh, that's know, spent right. Some time looking at this, and and um, I had wanted to spend more time, but you know, it, 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 there's some there's some uh, real math here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're we yes. So so yeah, thank you very much to Jeremy, uh, who a fantastic volunteer who who gave us some some really good solid hints. Um, and not just hints, but like some, you know, t he was the one that kind of informed us that the the rate, uh, you know, the essentially the sampling rate or the rate that we were trying to deal with the fire hose of data coming in from the from the Pluto SDR, a little bit too high to to really kind of have an easy stability situation, and that actually is is very important bit of information. Um, anyway, I uh, hope he he has uh, some time to come back and and look at this and and. Jeremy, thank you very much. You're welcome back anytime, and uh, we'll we'll do right by you. So I'll turn it over to, to Paul to kind of give us a little tour uh, of what our circuit is up to in the lab. Well, yeah, I'm not sure that I know, but this is one example of a test that we ran. Um, this is a fairly long run. You can see uh, here on this. All right, first of all, you see my screen. And do you see my cursor? Yes. Yes. Okay. So over here, there's that one star. That's the one run that actually worked and demodulated. So down here on zero error rate, you can see the accumulators 
are reasonably well behaved and even zoomed in they're they're pretty much nailed on zero i mean that mean look how big this scale is though that means these are within like ten thousand of zero um but then there's all these other levels that they settle at um, accumulators are a little bit high here and higher there and and the some of the time they're on this curve where they looks like they're settling down depending on what the the gain the eye gain in this case is being varied uh, is and you'd think that way out here where they're nice and stable would be where you'd want to be but they're stable and wrong <laughs> so that's not necessarily the best place and we don't see any successful demodulation out here either Meanwhile, yeah, and because we're in loopback, we would expect the accumulator to be uh, the mean zero, since since if we're looping back, there's no frequency offset between the TX and the RX. So the, the accumulator should be mean zero, is what I would expect. Yeah, and we see that when it's working. Right. Um, it's not exactly zero, but it has nicely distributed around zero. I can show a chart of that on a, one of the other examples. Um, yeah, and we wouldn't expect it to be exactly zero. That, that's why I say mean zero. It should just be moving around zero. And in, in you want you know, if we could find gains that minimize that standard deviation, if we, you will, that would be you know an optimized gain. Yeah. So if we look up here in the on the second graph, uh, the black dots represent the number of bits that were attempted during that test interval, which is a relatively constant amount of actual wall time. Not exactly constant because it's being timed by Linux, but it's pretty constant. And then the red ones are the number of errors. So you see they're usually half, representing 50% bit error rate, which is what you get if you're not demodulating uh, correctly. Um, these ones that are demodulated correctly are, are almost indistinguishable from zero on this graph. Uh, and this represents the basically uh, the error of the bit timing recovery. So there's a a very common a uh, couple of common levels here where the, the bit recovery is like 2 million bits where there should have been 50,000. Um, but there are other places where it's settles. They're not exact. And sometimes it gets into this uh, kind of a, a case where it's very high, like 4 million um, where it should have been 50,000, but sort of braided together. <laughs> you can't quite see it at the scale, but there's a, there's a pattern to this and the errors are falling along and occasionally it'll jump down and get closer to working and sometimes even very close like right here, but uh, it's still way out and is not able to actually lock on. Uh, the fact that it jumps between these rough levels, I'm sure that means something, but I don't know what. Yeah, no, it's a big clue. I think we've got a, We've got some stability, and we're, but we're not uh, treating it right, so we're not configuring it correctly. So these look like stable states to me. They so great. they settle here for a reason, and you know we're really close. This is very close to good behavior. But the the accumulator being non-zero, well, not exactly. I mean, the you know we've accumulated and we've and we're storing some error. So basically, accumulation is saying we're forcing if the accumulator was zero which is what it should be then our f1 or f2 frequency is where it should be but now because the accumulator is high yeah. by some amount the f1 or f2 is going to be high by you know, when this looks like f1 and f2 are just pretty much on top of each other so they're they're kind of reaching the same value so f1 and f2 are high so so the resulting bit rate is going to be higher Right. So, I mean, yeah. this is consistent. The bit rates up at the top, uh, you know, these high bit rates, higher than expected bit rates are consistent with the accumulator. And even, you know, in the in, near the right end, we see some accumulators that are a little bit lower in value. And then we, we the, the corresponds to the to the error rate and the bit rate uh, that we've accumulated or, you know, we've received and that those are dropping down as well. So there, there's a direct correlation, I think, between the accumulator value and, and the um, number of bits received. And yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're shoving it off of our desired set point somehow. Yeah, we didn't intend to, but we're. It's like we're okay. It's trying very hard to get back to, 
to to good behavior but somewhere along the way we've we've set it up to where we're really pushing it hard off of the you know because that you can you can clearly see the curve you know in the accumulation uh pain here um you know we got a a, a decent shot at good control but somehow we're 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 off the mark somewhere yeah I, I i have a suspicion about that i'm not sure when we want to get there but um has having to do with what you had looked like at last night with the um uh loop analysis so um i, th I think there's some some information there that's i think going to be helpful oh good let's, let's switch to another one of these uh, visualizations um now what have I done? Zoomed. <laughs> That's not what I intended to have. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> um, Look at all that data. I don't know what you're seeing exactly. I see a, a green rectangle on my screen, but it doesn't correspond to anything that I would have selected. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay, now I can see it. Okay. Oh, very good. So... Now you're seeing a whole graph, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So this this uh, third one here shows a, a extreme zoom in of the accumulator. That's what it looks like when it's happy. It's uh, within a, a few thousand of zero and noise looking and looks like a mean zero roughly. Yeah, so, it's, doing his, see, uh, it's doing his job. These areas where it's looking good correspond to the areas where it's actually able to be modulated and give zero error rate bursts uh, even though they're all spread out at different gains uh, it's in a nice state and then it goes woo and then it locks <laughs> back in and i don't know what's what's making it go woo but here we're jumping up to uh, to about a million bits per right yeah dollars. that's because that that's what that means on that top chart there the top pane those black dots mean that we now have a we're now saying that the bit rate is huge so we're totally unlocked we have no idea what's going on we're just like looking at the data coming in and guessing that the bit rates this huge number and the parts where that top pane where we got stuff down near zero that's where everything's working good and those stars actually mean that we've declared a success like we have worked a lot we've gotten everything demodulated it would decode we pass things along and we declare a victory so so the the test code is set up to like sieve through a bunch of pi gain pairs and look at things you know and we're expecting to see like a curve like an area where the pi gains in the pi filter make everything happy and this behavior is uh is a little bit unexpected but but that's that's what we're looking at in the top pane so this unlocked condition where the where it jumps way up and it has 50% error you can see that the red red dots are the error conditions and the black dots are the that's how many we attempted and a 50% error is like it's just nuts it doesn't know what we're doing um and you can see that there's two separate states there so it's not just bl black dots are all over the place it's not wandering around it's actually locked in on some other sort of mode so it's you know it's drawn yeah, off it's into this stable state of messed up. Yeah. <laughs> it's important to remember in analyzing these graphs, and I tend to forget it, and I did just a little while ago. This is not a continuous time test. It's a bunch of individual tests where the system is being reset, or we'd like to be resetting it. All we can really do is re-init the register value. Um, and so it didn't really jump from there to there. It started again and ended up, yeah. In a bad place. Um, so. Yeah. And another run with the exact same conditions can make a graph that doesn't look like this, that has different regions of success and different regions of failure. Yeah. Although we have seen some consistency around like a, a proportional gain of 100 hex. Yeah. Clearly, if you get too far away from that, then yeah. it just never works. Yeah. And sometimes it's it, I mean, really like, it there. doesn't work like as in it. It will give you not a number and end. So, you know, we've we've gone on these excursions with the gain pairs like way out there. 
So overall, it's actually acting right. So we got we got something that's tripping us up. I think it's uh, we're super close. Um, yeah, it, and everything is behaving the way it appears to in the pictures. I mean, in the block diagrams, then not a number coming out of meaning that the bit count of attempted bits was zero <laughs> means that the clock recovery is somehow flatlined. It's not generating any transitions or not generating them. Yeah. The within that one second, roughly test interval. Um, that seems like that ought to be vanishingly rare. Uh, so something specific is happening. It's still pretty rare, but it does happen if you run the test for long enough where it, where it flatlines the, the clock recovery. Yeah. I mean, if, if the F1, F2, you know, I think if they're positive, if they're above frequency, we, we see these um, regions where we have these really high bit rates. I'm wondering if, if F1, F2 could get into a state where they're below frequency by some large amount, if that effectively will zero the, the bit, bit clock, uh, the recovered, the, the DN and CN that we were looking at previously. Oh, I didn't think about that. Um, um, it would have to be off by just the right amount, right? It would not just negative. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I would think. Huh. Okay. But I mean, I, it, 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 I'm thinking that 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 it could be related to, you know, a particular frequency offset, maybe a negative frequency offset. I mean, yeah. You know, what's interesting is that you know we're mixing the F1. Uh, output and the F2 output to generate the, the bit clocks. So, I mean, they, they could be kind of, I don't know, you might have a high rate one and a low rate one, or, uh, and it, I don't know exactly, you know, I haven't looked at the math, you know, to say exactly what would happen to the output frequencies, right? I mean, it, but there there could maybe be a particular state where, you know, the 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 output frequency ends up being zero. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I actually, so I have this set up in Simulink with the, with a model in Simulink, like to extract the, um, I think what you call D and C, the CN. Mm -hmm. D. So, so I've got, I mean, I can go in and mess it up and see if I can duplicate or, or give like a picture. Cause all I've ever done is like generate the bit clock in Simulink with correct input. And I haven't really mm -hmm. messed with it very hard. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I could go back and like, is there, I, I, so I, I think what you're saying is if we have something going on in our implementation on hardware where the incoming, so we, we take the, the sample stream, we take our input sample stream. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we have an NCO, a numerically controlled oscillator at F1, and we have a numerically controlled oscillator at F2. Mm -hmm. So those are our two two frequencies. So for those of you um, following along, uh, minimum our minimum shift keying, we have two frequencies, and uh, it's frequency shift keying. So we're just going from this frequency to this frequency, uh, pretty fast. And what we've done is we've set it up to where the math makes it to where we have no phase jumps, no discontinuities in these two um, sine waves. If you want to look at it like a sine wave, sine wave at F1, sine wave at F2, they're separated by half the bit rate or bit rates, uh, about 54 kilohertz. So about 27 kilohertz apart. And and we, so we set it up to where they, they smoothly transition from one to the other. And this is magic. It really makes things great. So what we do is we multiply our incoming signal by the two NCOs and we have those NCOs outputting like both a sine and a cosine, so off by 90 degrees. So we have these four signals that we're using in the math. And you saw that in the um, in the block diagram that Matthew showed. So the upper arm and the lower arm, you know, and the NCO is producing, you know, 90 degree phase shift. So you end up with these four signals. And those four signals are used in the clock recovery. So the clock recovery taps off and we, we end up with, um, you know, it recovering the transitions from these incoming frequencies. So if there is some sort of weird, like, vandalism going on uh, with our clock recovery, maybe we should start messing up things, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, there we go, the VCO1 and VCO2, so, which is right. both 
voltage controlled oscillator. So essentially an NCO here, and you can see the pi over two. So we have a sine and a cosine from both of these NCOs. And we're doing this cross multiply, you know, sum, and we get the I timer and the Q timer is what it's called here in this particular paper. But, right, I think but this we, is equivalent to the CN and DN that we, we looked at previous. Yes. Yeah. This, And I think we that's what we call it in the code. So a CN and a DN instead of an yes. I-timer and a Q-timer. But it is literally, it's, this is the same thing. It's really quite beautiful. It gives you really good information to then go back and you feed this back in and you're able to then, you know, integrate and dump at the right times. So you're just measuring up the energy that you get during these times. Because if you don't know exactly when to start and stop measuring the energy, then none of the stuff makes any sense. But it might be worth, you know, if there's some sort of weirdness going on with the incoming, like, so what defects do you get? For, <laughs> is there like, yeah. is, like, is there some sort of weirdness? Like, how good do you have to be? Is, is this I don't think it's that fragile because, I mean, this is deployed all over the place. It's just not in the open. And that's one of the challenges that we've had is that, so we're trying to do this in the open. This MSK is a powerhouse and it's been deployed all over the place, but none of these examples are published. So there's there's tricks of the trade and tribal lore that we don't really know that we're going to have to figure out and then and then publish and then then work through ourselves. So maybe... There's uh, some trickery here. There's something that it has to be added or the you have to ensure some sort of quality. I don't know. So so we can go back and, and yeah. do some math and I, here. And I, I would suggest, say, like the, the BCO, let's say, say BCO1, if it was, if your frequency adjustment, you know, basically took the frequency that the VCO1 is generating to zero, Right, then you're getting zeros coming in, and you're multiplying, say, the zero here and here and here. You're going the outputs are gonna go to zero. So if e, if e, even one VCO, the frequency adjustment takes it down, so so you're effectively zero. You're you're gonna get this. Um, the output clocks are gonna be zeros, right? They're not gonna be toggling. Okay, it doesn't seem like it would be that fragile, but like we should we should go and make sure that we understand how reliable it is or or what the essentially what the selectivity of this is so i can do that and and check I, yeah i'm pretty confident though this is this is the clock recovery that's been used in deployment so you know we we know from massey's work and and um and you know the the projects that he that he's worked on and all the stuff that's actually published that this is this is how you do it mm -hmm. Understanding though the limits would be good. So if there's some sort of, and then you know it may not be a limit of the signal. The signal coming in might be totally fine. If there's something weird going on in the Pluto, then yeah. Then that so I mean we would expect, right? I mean the, the Costa Sloop is a form of a PLL, right? So I mean it, it's it's going to have a pull in range and a pull out range, and so it's going to be in in a loop bandwidth. So there's going to be states where it's happy, you know, and, and going to do the right thing. And then, you know, if, if it's configured incorrectly or, you know, we have bad gains, then it's going to do weird stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The gain question is, is, and I guess we did kind of try to do it in a, I, I hesitate to use the, the adjectives I'm tempted to use, but like we're trying to do it in kind of a brute force way. We're trying to like, okay, yes. let's try a bunch of gains. Let's go through and just search them out. This is really maybe not a, and you know, if you go on like Reddit DSP or wander around Stack Overflow, then people will giggle at you for trying this, that you need to actually like know what you're doing and figure out your, you know, your gain pairs. And so, with some a little bit of book learning we've made some progress here and and gotten you know in between jeremy's work so he started on this and got pretty darn far and then some work that we we did over the past uh week or so i think we're getting a idea now of like okay let's let's go ahead and have a working model of of what we've built um it's always great if a brute force solution will give you your results but but i've i've come to uh, appreciate that this sort of control loop is uh, uh, maybe it can't be just simply brute force that these gain pairs can't aren't just going to pop out from just trying a bunch in in code and you know there's too many 
interdependencies. They're too, it's too, a little too complicated. You change one, the other completely moves off the mark and looking at the, you know, so, so actually looking at like the poles and zeros and appreciating that the accumulator in the NCO actually does add its own, you know, uh, it, it actually is part of the control system. It's like, oh, it's a lot more complicated than I thought, you know, so my idea that we could isolate it down to the PI controller and ice and, analyze that in in isolation and just try a bunch of pairs that was not um yeah we, we could have lucked out but we haven't so far so you know backing up yeah, and... but I, I think i don't know if we can pull up um your maybe the the version two of what you did last night or, or maybe we want to start with version one yeah paul is there any way you can help from getting that to to go on this well, I, I can i can pull or, or yeah yeah i can't from here okay so i, I want to start with version one here we go okay so can we can we see this um yeah okay so i i, I don't know if you want to go through this in more detail but i, I there was one thing that i wanted to uh, bring up. So when we were discussing last night, um, there's a, a gain in the error detector, right? Yeah. And the error detector is, is really, again, the error is sine theta, um, where theta is the phase offset from, from ideal. So if, if theta is zero, we have no error and the sine theta is going to be zero. Right. Um, and so that's what we want. That's that's what we're trying to minimize that. But then we're we're accumulating that sine theta over the bit time, right? And so that accumulation is is in fact a gain. So initially, um, in this version, you had just picked um, a KD of pi. Yeah. And uh, and so then you know the we were just saying that the the error detector gain. I'm oh, sorry. It is pi effectively, right? And I was thinking, well, that's that's actually really small because we're we're again accumulating um, on every sample clock. Now, well, we'll we'll start here um, on every sample clock, right? Um, yeah, is, was what I had argued, but I'm I'm wrong on that. So, but let's uh, let's just review. Oh no, the first one is important. Um, so you you ran this i'm sorry for scrolling around um and with, with that with that um error gain being pi and then you know you, you plotted the step response and then the poles and then computed the the gains right the yeah. p gain and i now the, my first comment here is is we can't even do this i gain right now no we can do that this one in the in the next one so, so the, you know, we can be basically a, a gain of one for either P or I is, is one over 256, right? So, so we can approximate these numbers, you know, with some amount of resolution. Um, but these numbers aren't right, I would, is my argument because we don't have the correct error gain. Right. So. And we I know that that's just a approximation because the 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 that comes from um, the continuous model. So, right, you know. So but, I mean, but, I'm, when you go to a discrete model and when you do things like like normalize and accumulate, then you know it it should be clear that that assumptions like that will will have to ch change. Right. Um, so then then you did a version two after I argued about the, or my my assertion rather that the, the um, gain is really FS over bit rate. And so yeah. my argument there is that FS is, is the underlying clock. And then, um, and then the, we're accumulating on every bit clock, bit clock, not bit clock. I'm sorry. On every um, sample clock rather. Right. So, um, so we take the uh, actually oh FS over the sample clock. So bit rate actually it, it's not bit rate. It should oh it is bit rate. Is it bit rate? No, it's not bit rate. It's 
it's the I was gonna say it's it should be the FS over the number of samples per bit, right? So we're so we we we've thrown away every 20, 24 of twenty five samples. So we've brought our our bit our uh, sam our effective sample rate down to two point five four. So this should be sixty one point four four divided by two point five four was my argument was oh, okay. was my assertion. Right? All right, yeah, that's and not then, the right number. That would be twenty five then. Yeah, and then the, and then I don't think we need the pi factor because the the error is sine theta, so it's going to be from zero to one. Right. Um, ah, not, okay. So it's already in there. It's already normalized. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so, but what's interesting here is this, if we go down and look at the gains again, the gains have gotten much smaller. Yes. Yeah. Cause we went from like having the gain, a gain of 3.14 of pi to like 146 because of the right. scaling factor that I, that I, that we were using. Right. So, but what's interesting is the the KI gain here, we is less than one over two fifty six. Yeah, so we can't represent it. Right. Um, Which makes but, it hard to test. <laughs> right, right. I mean, so we we can we can, you know, that that was kind of a uh, an arbitrary number I picked, right? Yeah. I mean, so we, we I mean, can yeah, we can it, change it. We can we yes. can yeah. It's not. It, I mean, this is these are impediments we were putting. In, in front of ourselves but i mean we make our best guess like one over 256 is a pretty small number it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to know like what your coefficients are going to be before you finish right so i mean but this, so this analysis is actually i think incredibly useful because i'm going to go back to the to the to the um kd assignment here and i'm going to tell you i was wrong <laughs> in that the KD should actually just be FS. Oh, it should be FS. FS. Okay, yeah, so, so it should be the two fifty six. The okay, yeah, because the two okay, so the two fifty six is the is the okay. So what we're doing for for people following along is that we are we're kind of stuck. Okay, you're always stuck with hardware, so you're always kind of like you deal with what you have, you know, unless you can design everything from scratch. And so we're not like we're not that sort of organization. Okay, so we. We have this Pluto, and it has a essentially a, a, a clock rate of sixty one point four four megahertz. That's like that's where it wants to operate. And what we've done is we've thrown away twenty four out of twenty five of those samples to get it down to a you know since our signal is not a hugely wide broadband signal, it's fairly in our view kind of kind of narrow it's broadband for some but narrow for for others and so we we need to kind of get in the right ballpark and so what we are what we have is we've knocked down our bandwidth of 61.44 megahertz down to 2.56 megahertz by by doing this and that's actually uh, as paul explained last night it's actually the lowest um rate that the pluto really wants to deal with so we you know a 2.56 megahertz bandwidth and our signal is in there somewhere so so now we have a, a, a easier uh thing to deal with and so you know the the f of s in this particular uh, case or the sample rate is that 2.56 but i then divided it by the bit rate of our signal of interest of 54 kilohertz and so that that scaling is wrong and what we really need to work with is the scaling that we uh that we um enforced upon the um the sample stream is that right okay so yeah, tw yeah. 25 so, instead of 100 and some odd so it it that, right. that'll give so, us new numbers exactly so so here's what i'm thinking and so I'm, I'm sure you'll update this and we can confirm but but in version one you used pi yeah and in version two we're using fs over bit rate which you know, this was my argument, but it's still not the right number times pi. So this is a much larger number than pi, right? Yes, one hundred and forty-four. And we saw the gains go down. Yes, get smaller. The uh, from what we computed here, and now what I'm arguing is that KD is equal to to FS, and the pi is gone, and the bit rate is gone. So they drop out. Yes. So now, you know, if things are linear that the gain should even get smaller and much, much, much smaller. Yeah, that'll be really tiny. 
so that we yeah. need to rescale everything to be able well, to. Well, I, I think what we need to do. So the reason that the FS is um, the reason we're FS and not uh, modify, not scaled by the bit rate or the, the lower sample rate is, and I'll just pull this up. Um, so th this is the integration process here in the um, Costas loop. So this, this is where we're integrating the sine and the cosine. And so I had gone back, you know, we've, we've gone around on this a couple of times. And, you know, in the sample discard, I was intending that, that we would have a, a clock or a, a, an enable signal that would say, here's the, the sample that's valid, right? And then that sample just lives or is stable for 26 sample or 25 sample clocks um, uh, at the 61.44, right? So we're base, but but the, the samples now are updating every 2.56 megahertz. But the underlying clock is still 61.44. I had intended in in as part of this is to basically drop the accumulation rate to that 2.56. But in the code right here that I'm showing, the, the enable signal is always one and the RX S valid is always one. I was wanting to use the S valid to be that would only be one every 25th sample, but that was problematic for other reasons. I, I didn't, I wasn't cohesive or consistent in how I was treating that clock. So what I said, and what I came up with was, okay, we're, we're just going to drop every 25th or 24 or 25 samples, but that 25th one will be valid for this amount of time for a, for a 2.56 megahertz clock. And then we we also, if you remember, we we um, added a, a, a sample discard to the NCO so that the NCO is only valid. We, we pick the same number. So the NCO outputs are only changing every 2.56, but the underlying clock is still 61.44. So what, again, the, what we, what the intention was is say this accumulator would be accumulating at 2.56 megahertz, but it's not. This accumulator at this moment is accumulating at 61.44. There's no, there's no enable or a clock enable happening here that only updates it every 2.56. So I, I need, you know, so right now I would say the error gain is, is FS 61.44. Oh, wow. Okay. And so that, yeah, that's, so that's going to create really, really, really small gains, right? <laughs> so we, we're just probably playing in this area where the gains are just massive. And of course, nothing's going to work right. Okay. It, it, assuming that, that, that you're, that, um, your analysis is is ballpark, right? In into what's really happening in this loop. So I I, I mean I, I'm not doubting that it is. I'm just saying you know I, um yeah maybe we missed something or whatever. I, I mean, but I think it it's it's really valuable in that it's giving them this clue that we just might be <laughs> way out of scale. Okay. Um, no, that matches in, in, the observation too. Like right. that sort of makes some some sense here. And if I was a little smarter or didn't, you know, had more math, I think I could probably then I'd recognize like these modes that we're seeing and not the mm -hmm. randomness, like it would make more sense. So, I right. mean, I'll keep chipping away because yes, there's some, there are some simplifications in the, in the, in the paper. Um, you know, like we're, we're, whenever you, like, if you start out a lot of people and I did the same thing, start out with a continuous model. So it's continuous time. And then when you move to discrete, you can see what happens. Like, no, it isn't just zero to pi. You can't just say pi for the gain. You actually do have to look at the way that you defined your numbering system. It's not, oh, yes, you, you are representing zero to pi. That's what we're representing for the, for the, for what we're dealing with. But with the way that you represent the numbers can change dramatically. It can be a completely different number. Like right now we're saying the gain is f of s which is much, it, that represents pi, but the number has to be correct in the analysis and that will make the gains change. You know, right. so, you know, we're, this is, a, this is a tale as old as time in, uh, in digital design. So <laughs> it, 
and it's very exciting to see. So, so yeah, we're on the right track. There are some simplifications we need to continue and get a better handle on it. So I guess what, what is, what's your next action? Is there's you, you, it sounds like you want to go ahead and maybe make some changes. Well, and... So, yeah, I mean, if, 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 if this is accurate, right. If this, if this um, theory or, or, you know, um, the word escapes me for the moment, but, but my suggestion here, I'm, what I'm proposing could be an issue, um, you know, based on your analysis is that our gains are just massively large <laughs> compared to what they should be. So the, it, it, you know, in order to validate oh, okay. that analysis, yeah, we, we could either like change the way that we represent the gains so that we can try these numbers. And then if it suddenly works, then, then we have a, right. Right. So there's there's two ways I think we could approach this. One is we could um, make a, a gain of one be, say, one over 1024 or one over 20048. Um, but, you know, you, you add that much precision to things and, and then, you know, you need a lot more bits to represent that kind of stuff. Yeah. Maybe it's feasible, you know, uh, but. um but I'm, I'm not sure that's my preferred approach. So I'm, I'm thinking here, I, I need to bring a clock in and reduce the accumulation rate, say to 2.56, you know, match, match our, our sample discard rate such that this accumulator is only accumulating um, at, at, the, at the effective sample rate based does, on the sample discard. Does that mean that the gain for that goes to 25? It means the gain would be SF, FS over the the effective sample rate. So in our system, it would be sixty one point four four over two point five six. That that okay. would be the gain, the, which okay. is the error detector gain. Gotcha. Which is twenty four. Oh, is it twenty four? Wait, wait, no, no, no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's not right. The error the error detector gain would be two point five six, right? Because we're accumulating. Um, over the, so there there's no no i'm sorry yeah yeah so the sample rate is 2.56 megahertz effectively right so if we accumulate at that 2.56 megahertz the gain is going to be um the 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 effective sample rate right so if if we're using if we're not using the the effective sample rate here in this code we're using the full sample rate 61.44 so i'm arguing that the gain is 61.44 mega, 61.44 million, right? Um, oh, okay. But so then if we, because again, you're, every sample, we're accumulating the error, right? Yeah. So the error, the error is constant over the bit, more or less, right? So we're, we're yeah, yeah. So we're like, here. we're, yeah, we're way off. Like we're, we're just running away with the accumulation if it's, if it's at a, different rate but if we had it at the same per million though yeah it would be it, that divided by fifty four thousand two hundred. well i mean you, you, the um so it's 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 dependent independent a bit rate 54 200 it's not independent it, it, integration time which is a bit well rate. The, no no so we're integrating over the bit time but the question is is how many samples are we integrating right, right? So we're all so, off. like uh, so if we assume that oh, our oh, you, yeah no, if we... you're right I, I apologize it is it is the sample rate over the bit time right because you're it, it's that ratio sorry rate kind of doing this in real time but you're right Paul it's it's sixty one point four four over the bit rate right so you're you're basically how many how many accumulations are we doing over that bit period yeah right we were, so we we're off a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no cool so you're right okay. no so your your version two is right because it should be the sample rate over the bit rate but it's still a really large number right <laughs> well yeah it, it works out to, well because if you assume it's pi like if you're in um book learning land where everything is well conditioned and you get to you know that it, it's like pi right but you know if it's fs divided by the bit rate then it's 144 or so and that drives down the like you said, it drives down our gains to below where we can represent them in the current numbering scheme for the registers. Right. So, 
if this if we updated this loop to accumulate instead at, at the um every 25th sample right yeah then then the the gain the um error gain would be 2.56 over the bit rate yes it, it, we keep making this mistake it's not 24 out of 25 it's 23 out of 24 that we're discarding <gasps> to get 2.56 is it okay 2.56 is 1 24th not 125th but 124th of 61.44 um sure you're right i'm just looking at what i actually am computing here so i'm taking the um so the txrx sample ratio is is what i'm saying um so i in my simulation it's set to 25 um so the rx sample rate is tx sample rate over the this ratio um and then I'm just looking where did it go? It's down here, I think. I had I basically I'm just missing it. Sample ratio arc um arc sample rate. Oh um Oh, okay. I've, I changed that to the TX sample rate. Yeah, that's right. It should be the same. But I, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm actually setting down here the the word. Where am I doing it? There's where I'm. I'm configuring the sample discard data, right? I'm putting that. Yeah. yeah. If that was in the MSK control register, but okay, maybe I guess in this simulation, I'm not just doing any sample discards. That, that's what it is. But if I had, I would have taken, I would have put in um, 24 into that register. Oh, I think I have it wrong too then. Because I've been just dividing by 25. 61.44 divided by 25 to get the new sample rate. I think yeah, so that, I mean, that I, was um, the right number. But that, that might be right for all I know, but it's not 2.56 then. It's some other number. It's pretty close though, isn't it? I mean, that's what we had. Um, I might have it in the um in the MATLAB PDF. Well, let me just look here. So th this is the the sample discard, right? So basically, um, our S valid is always one loop back when we're doing loop back is always one. So we can ignore that. But so basically, I have a discard count, and it, it's when it's zero, I reload the discard arc sample. So in, in my case here, this will be twenty four. So I'm 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 gonna for I'm gonna count for twenty four. Yeah, and yeah. And then yeah. on the on the twenty fifth sample. Or, or I'm counting down by you know 20 uh 24 to zero right 24 to zero so that's 25 samples right but when it's zero I'm going to capture the input sample and and use that right so I'm updating the samples every 25th clock okay so it's wait yeah. until 25. Yeah. So basically, I, I put in 24, and when I get to zero, I capture, right? So that's 25 clocks. Because I'm 24 to zero is 25 clocks, right? And, but so every, every 25th clock, I'm capturing a new sample. Does that make sense? The off by ones are, are strong with me here. Um, <laughs> I don't, it depends on the semantics of this code, which I don't know in detail. Uh, if it's really discarding 24 out of 25, then we need to start talking about a different number than 2.56. Okay. Well, I think it's, so I think it's just in my mind, and I might be doing the math wrong, but it should just be uh, 61 point. And I can't see it. 61.4. And why is that? just 
got stupid. <laughs> That's not what happened. <laughs> we'll clean it there up we in post. <laughs> Divided by uh, uh, 25, right? 2.4576. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same number I have in the MATLAB because I've been maybe naively dividing by twenty five to get a to get to get rid of twenty four. To have one out of twenty five. Yeah. I, I think it's twenty five. I, I could I could um put this, this back into the simulation and measure the the um the time between the you know, the up sample updates or how long each sample is stable after the just discard. Yeah. It should be it, it should be this period, basically. No, this is where get rid of the off by one uncertainties. That... Yeah, this is good stuff to to double check. It's it's a well earned wisdom uh, to make sure that that we we got this uh, that we're all in agreement about what the discard rate is and how to define yeah. it. So, but let's... so I think the point though, I I think you know, yeah, we need to know exactly the right one. But if we take the two four, uh, five seven six. And we divide that by the bit rate. No, is it the yeah the bit rate right? Um, and e six by fifty two four hundred. So so our our oh fifty four two, sorry. Oh, thanks. easy to do. So I I I'm, I'm my argument then is that that our error gain is about forty five. Okay, so it's going to be the the that that will mean that the pi gains will be somewhere in between the ones for the continuous case of pi being the gain and the previously calculated 140 something odd. So we'll get closer back right. to the original results, but they'll still be smaller. So we need to look at how to represent the numbers to test it. If we want to do yeah. option one, which is to make our numbering system match the calculated. Uh, proportional and integral gains to go ahead and just test it and see if we can get some better results with what we have in the lab today. And then right. you were working your way up to telling us about an option two, which I think was to go back and to change the clock rate with the enable signal. It was, I think, the um, re receive, active, and enable. That, that yeah. yeah, that one, to the, the, where the enable and the RxS valid are both or I think that's right. Yeah, this is the right code, like to go ahead and make everything matched. And that will also do the same thing. That's also like dragging up the, essentially dragging up the resolution um, back right. higher into the, probably maybe into the zone that we're already in. Yeah. So, yeah, right. So basically the idea here is, is to accumulate only, um, again, every, 25th sample right if 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 our discard rate is 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 25 you know we, whatever we can we yeah. can we, we, uh normalize our understanding of that right but but whatever it is i only want to accumulate on those uh sample updates rather than for the for the entire you right. know 61.44 over 52 400 samples that occur in that bit period right right so so that brings that that error gain way down yeah. It, um, but it's it's probably going to bring it down like the the version two you had, right? Um, yeah, it'll be in that ballpark. It won't be as small as the version two, I don't think. It'll be a little bigger, it, but that's going to be the order well, of magnitude, right? I think it's yeah. So I mean, it's it's actually a little smaller than this because I think pi is really one. Oh. Okay, so the pi drops out. It's not really a scaling factor for pi, right? Well, I mean, again, so my my argument is only that that the the error signal is is sine theta, okay, right? Um, and so sine theta is just going to be zero to one. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So it could be small. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll ponder. And, uh, so so yeah, if we do if we use the two point, so I mean it's a third of of this. So that yeah. means the gains come up a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, which, which is better because we can't quite yeah. represent these gains. <laughs> right. So yeah, option one would be, um, you 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 tell me if you re you recomputed this for the sixty one point four four over the bit rate, then and then we can see what the gains are. Can we represent those gains? in in the code um in some way that we can try those 
um, that, that would probably be, well, I don't know if that's easier. And then option two would be just, um, refactor it, the uh, sample rate. Yeah. Re, re, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the accumulator. So they're accumulating at the lower sample rate. Okay. Got it. All right. And that, that should bring the gains up, right? So that, that they, they hopefully would then be within our ability to represent them in the yeah. current code. Yeah. No, it's just I, I, I'm actually a little bit more inclined to do option two. Um, but op option one is probably feasible. I'm just, I just have to, we'd have to make sure that the, you know, the bit widths are, are such that we can represent that well enough. Yeah. Both of them require code changes. So like, yes. I think, and the, the one that's probably the, the, the least, um, the option out of one and two, that's the uh, least risky is, is two, because it actually is moving closer to like an accurate representation of reality. And then, because option one, the the width of uh, the representation of the numbers is a dependent, sort of a dependent uh, variable, and not an independent variable. You you want your representation of your numbers to follow your design. Um, so I'd, I'd be a little more inclined to like let's let's do the option two first and say, okay, we're going to make it. We now know. Uh, how fast the fire hose is coming at us. Right. So, so we, and then, and then say, okay, here is our understanding of what's really going on with the transfer functions and the gains and everything. And then, okay, here, can we represent this tiny number and then pick the right width or the right representation and, and give us the most margin for moving around? Cause we're still going to want to go back and fine tune because there's all sorts of other things. There's all sorts of other factors in the actual hardware. We're still going to want to like test the gains, but we're going to want to see like a really nice set of behaviors. And this will yeah. be possible if we can center the, the numerical representation of the gains right on top of the center, you know, of our uh, numerical representation space. But we get that by refactoring the, the code, I think, to, to where we're matching the right rate of yeah. the fire hose. And, I, and, you know, I, I had tried this to do this previously, but where I, I was, and I see, I, I, I see how to do it now. The problem was, you know, we get a one clock pulse that represents the, the 25th sample, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that seemed to but, make sense to me. Like, is it also, but, is it zeroing? Well, the, the is it giving was, us like other samples that are all zero then? Is it? No, no, it, it just takes the sample that was there and repeats it for 25 clocks effectively oh. so so the, the sample is is stable for those 25 fs clocks right and then it updates so the, the and this is important in that um is it because well, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually so there's actually that, that, a, like there's an edge there though it's 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 stable it's the same value but it's it's yeah it's clocking us so we're right, like, so like other it, stuff it, is then happening that that we did not anticipate happening. Well, right. So, so, so each clock, the clock here is 61.44, right? So then, then again, these are our ones for our neat purposes here. So basically every 25th, this is the, the, the decimated uh, output, right? So this is the sample that's coming out of this. And so it, it gets, we latch it every 25th clock, right? When the discard count gets to zero, we capture it. So this value is not going to change for another 25 clocks. So that the sample itself is stable. So then, then it's going to go into and be multiplied. Um, well, it's going to go all the way into the Costa loop and we're going to basically multiply that sample um, here, right? Uh, again, this is the, this is happening at 61.44. Yeah, yeah. So we, we just keep going. Right, we, but we so were the, the, ru running the numbers when we should yeah. So not be. It, it's just gonna you know it, it's gonna keep multiplying this sample by this by the sign, and we've decimated the sign by the same amount, right? So yeah. they're just gonna they're gonna you're just gonna get the same value computed over and over and over. It, it's 
but it, in some ways, you know, you could say, well, power, but on the other way, these values aren't changing. So the gates aren't toggling. So you're not, it shouldn't really be impacting power. The only power is you're, you're consuming in the clock tree, right? Um, Cause the clock is toggling at the faster rate, but it's still going to toggle at the faster rate. So you're, you're effectively, you know, by gating this particular calculation, you're not saving anything. Um, Cause you're still running the clock at the 61.44. Um, and the, but these two values only change in every 25th sample. But where, where this was a problem and where I was hit, running it, into hiccups before was, was um, this in here, I, I was trying to, when I was doing the clock, clock gating, I would say if T clock one effectively and the sample clock, if we want to call it that equals one. But where the problem was is the, is the key clock and the sample clock aren't necessarily aligned. So, right. so when in the, when they're not aligned, I never execute this portion, right? So that 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 was the problem I was running into. I didn't quite put that all together. So I mean, I think all I need to do really is do the if sample clock here, um, right, and then. So if T clock is one, I'm going to, I'm going to capture, I'm going to do the dump and everything that I'm normally going to do. But if T clock's not one, then I'm, I'm going to do this update every sample clock that, which is the discarded clock. Right. So that, that should work. Okay. So th this, this should be, so I can, I'll do this and then I can run a, a simulation, make sure nothing's horribly broken. And then um, assuming that it's not, uh, we, we can push it up. Um, and to GitHub and, and we can do a build and, and try it. Okay. And, and then, um, so I'm gonna leave the gains over one over 256. And then, um, and we're, we, we're, but it's still gonna be close, right? I think it's still gonna be close if, cause this was, this was the, FS over bit rate. Yeah, that's like okay, a... but well, it's going to be quite. A, it's going to be twenty five times smaller. Well, so the, it's these numbers be pi times. It's and also don't forget the pi. Oh like yeah, tw really... twenty five. So yeah, twenty five times pi smaller, right? Um, so these numbers hopefully come up within our ability to to represent them. The 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 three the point oh oh three one we can represent. It was really this yeah ki that was too small. But I think th this should come up enough that we can re represent this, I think. Because, I mean, it wasn't that far off, right? So it's 1 over 256 is what we're currently able to do. Yeah, the far so the, the gain it becomes 2.54 megahertz, right? Yeah. Okay. So, we're, yeah, we, we can represent like a 0 0.004, 0 0.039, and... So this is 0 0.006. So this is like an order of magnitude smaller. So I guess that that's really a question is what the what's this number gonna be um with that with that uh 2.54 or 2.4576 sample rate. Okay, so it's not it isn't sixty-one it isn't sixty-one point four four divided by the bit rate, it's sixty-one point four four megahertz divided by no, it'll be 2.5, whatever so, our right number is, divided by the bit rate. Oh, okay. So 2.56 2 megahertz divided by bit rate is the gain. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I wrote it down wrong. Okay. I'll put that back into the the uh, model yeah. and then run a, run a version 3.0 and put it on Slack. Right. So that then that would be, you know, we can see what that number yeah. is and then we can just you know uh, you know i could add a bit or two um so we go one over 512 or one over 256 if needed or two ten twenty four if needed and right. then that so we're we're and it may end up doing both i'll, I'll yeah i think i'll, I'll start the 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 um loop update now and then um after we see what the numbers are I, I'll, if i if i need to i'll update the um the scaling as well yeah i suspect that we might have to because it's still going to be pretty tiny it's still going to be yeah. and we're also losing like if we dump the if, if it's really times one because it's already normalized 
you know, so if we've already normalized out the pi, zero to pi, mm -hmm. and it's now zero to one, that we've already, then that will make the number smaller. Should make it larger, right? Because we're because oh. the yeah, we're the gain will be smaller. Okay, I believe you. <laughs> but, well, I mean, so my art when I the between the two run run one and run two, the the error gain went up and the in the p and i gains went down, right? Yes. So yeah. so if oh, we take right. the pi yeah, yeah. out, then the, then the error yeah. gain is coming down, so the p and i should come up. So yes. They're inversely proportional. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I I, I got lost lost in the chain there yes <laughs> okay easy. so yeah i'll just <laughs> yes it, this this crap is hard um okay so yeah we'll go do that and and then um yeah report back on slack and then then uh oh gosh i can't even imagine what we'll be talking about in a week this is this is great yeah well yeah i mean really hopefully that, that this uh that we um you know, start seeing better results in the lab if we get, you know, if if this is right, if everything's you hear that that we're looking at is is ballpark in the ballpark, you know, then our gains are just massively high and we would never expect it to work. And it's not repeatable. It's it's yeah, you know, which is what we're seeing. Miss. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it so wants it, to work. It, like we can tell that it really wants to work. The underlying math is good. It's just we're we're messing with its poor little mind. Yeah, yeah. And and there's so many of these things that that like interrelate that it's you know they're it's not always obvious that they're interrelating like whether we're we're uh accumulating over 61 megahertz or 2.5 megahertz and those types of things right right um yeah. so yeah there's a lot of subtleties that are that are um easy to miss true that's what makes it beautiful let, let me mention one of them um by just down sampling without a filter we're relying on the analog filters in the pluto to avoid, yeah, yeah. avoid aliasing. Um, I think we have them set too wide. Uh, we, yeah, I, I was saying, you know, for loopback, this should be fine, the sample discard. But, you know, if we're actually bringing an RF signal in, you're going to have a bunch of other stuff coming in with it that could alias into our into our band. Well, um, we, because we're but, doing real modulation, we've got stuff even in the digital loopback that's out of band. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, at two point five four, we're pretty oversampled to our particular signal. There, we're oversampled, but we're not overfiltered. The, right, but I mean, there shouldn't be a lot of there. There shouldn't be really any frequency components outside of our band, right? I mean, those tails from the MSK are, are infinite, so they're going to be there, but they're going to be should be really low. So even if they alias in, you know, it's some noise, but it shouldn't okay. be. I mean, I, I, I might be wrong, but I mean, that, that's just the way I'm conceptualizing it. Um, because well, there's no other frequency right. generation out of that signal, right? Um, but I, I was going to, so I, I'm not thinking there should be an issue in digital loopback, but maybe I'm, I'm being naive. <laughs> um, but certainly in, in the RF domain, I'm thinking we may want to use the the um, decimation filters that are in Pluto, or that you know come with the main Pluto build, because um, we use those, then then you know it's going to um, low pass filter and sample right, or you know to reduce the sample rate so that we get the we could get the two point five. Yeah, you know, we wouldn't use the sample discard anymore. We we use the decimation filters um, that are ahead of the modulator. Are they still in this build? they are in I, they're not they're not being i'm not sure if they're enabled i'm not sure what we're doing <laughs> yeah they're not enabled i don't think that they're deleted we removed some of the blocks but i think we left those in yeah like would that you, would that help paul is that kind of what you're after yeah if we used that honest to god decimator instead of just decimating <laughs> Um, or both solve the bandwidth like, problem. I think we would. I don't know how good the filters in the in the Pluto are, or even how they're implemented. But right now we've got it set to three megahertz, which is clearly too wide for a two point five megahertz sample rate. Um, yeah, yeah, but we, yeah, that's true. the the The, the filters are okay. They're they're a set of uh, 
they're essentially a set of like half band and decimation filters. And it's the same story on the the dev boards that we have for like the the ZC seven hundred six and the ZCU uh, one hundred two. So, you know, so I think the narrowest you can set it to on the Pluto is two hundred kilohertz. Yeah, that uh, sounds familiar. It's something like that. That would be too narrow, I guess, unless we offset it. Our, our IF is... Well, yeah, the, the F1, F2 can be, you know... the, the it, I picked an arbitrary number, so the 433 kilohertz IF, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be that. It could be 100 kilohertz or, you know... It, it, it just has to be a multiple of a quarter of the bit rate. Yeah, and it, to, and that's just to get it away from the from the from DC, right? Well, I mean, so the way in the in the modulator, right? You're you're just basically taking a you're you're multiplying the sine wave. The, you know, you're generating an F one and F two, right? And then you're multiplying the F one by a value or F two by a value to get the continuous phase aspects, right? So so that the transitions of F one to F two are are right. are smooth. Right. Yeah. But you know, so F one and F two though are, you know, they can't. They're not zero. It's not baseband in 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 a traditional sense, right? You're you're right. modulating in effectively a carrier directly. But you know, in this case, the carrier is an IF, not a true carrier. But you know, but the carrier that those F one and F two values, they just have to be a multiple. Well, not the F one and two themselves, but the the center frequency between the F one and F two has to be four times a quarter of the bit rate. I'm sorry, a multiple of a quarter of the bit rate, right? Yeah. So, so we could set those much smaller. I'm, 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 they're currently set at the 433 kilohertz as 32 times the quarter of the bit rate. So they could be 16 times or or eight times. So eight times would be about 100 kilohertz, give or take, right? Um, so they 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 could be brought down, you know, or even, you know, quite a bit, I think. Okay. If we if we brought them way down, we probably also want to implement complex modulation otherwise the image would be too close to filter out complex modulation this is a really interesting thing right <laughs> um I, i've been thinking and thinking about this i mean the way the modulator is at the moment complex there's not really a way to get a complex modulation out unless you kind of resample it um i mean because because you're you're just modulating a real sine wave right there's not there's not a second piece of information to modulate uh, on, onto a different, onto a, onto the quadrature um, sinusoid. So what, I, what I've been toying with in the back of my mind, because it is a to-do item to, to get a quadrature output, um, would be to use two MSK modems. And, and, and the first modem would, would operate on, on the um, zero phase and the second modem would operate on the 90 degree phase. And then, then you have a quadrature output, and then, and with all the benefits of it, I, I just hadn't really worked through the math and the signal, uh, the signal chain to say, am I going to really get what I want? <laughs> I mean, back in, but you know, because um, when you do the quadru the quadrature down convert, yeah, um, I'm still going to, yeah, no, they're going to be real signals affected. But I take the INQ independently. And then one goes into one modulator or demodulator, and the other goes into the other. And I, I need to think about it a little bit more. But that that was that was one approach I was I was mulling over is just using two modulators and two demodulators, and then um, putting them on the on the quadrature signals. I'm sure that's good in math land. I wonder if it wouldn't be better overall to just implement a tight bandpass filter in complex space that would give you a also give you a channel channel limiting filter for free which would probably be a good thing to have yeah right but i'm just saying that the modulators exists there's not there's not a a good way to get iq output right because it's 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 just modulating two real sinusoids so um but if you take the real modulated sample signal treated as i set q to zero which is what we're doing now basically and right take that complex signal and just run it through a complex filter that put a band pass around where the signal is supposed to be that would give you two benefits it would give you get rid of the image it would also narrow up the the transmitted channel occupancy 
Yeah, yeah. I guess I was thinking to use the. I was assuming that the ninety three sixty three had a in some sort of uh, bandpass output filter, um, but it, I hadn't looked at it recently to know that that's the case or not. So, so I was just kind of re relying on the um, output filtering. But if it's not really there or not effective, then yeah, we we can do we we can add our own bandpass filter in the digital domain. Yeah, I don't really. So it's going to take a real input, but it'll, it would have non-zero I and Q output. So it'd have an I input of zero or I input of a real I input, a Q input of zero, but the output would still be non-zero I and Q. We'd have to be. Yeah. Okay. I think. Uh, that might be a good way to do it. Yeah. It, and, and that's a separable sort of. Uh, project from mm -hmm. getting the stability going yes and they yes. shouldn't interfere with each other but that should add additional improvements and if there is any hinky do's with the with the filtering um and the other image causing us any trouble then it'll clear that it'll clear it up right yeah yeah and that this is what's kind of neat now at this point if we if you know i'm not sure you know, some people have expressed some interest, but, you know, we haven't had a lot of people come in. But I mean, if we could, we, you know, the the, the modem is a kind of a state now and there's some kind of modular pieces that we need. So like a lock detector or, you know, if we want this filter that that, that people could come in and do. Right. If they were interested, that would be more. It's not this huge thing. Right. It's just this piece that's kind of standalone. And yeah. And it, it's like something that we can describe, like. You know, right. <laughs> it's not an open-ended R and D or more heavy R than the D. This is a development challenge rather than a research challenge. Right, and, right. You know, it's a question so of I, us describing it well enough to engage somebody that and you know, we do have some interested people from UCSD. So right now they're they're in the middle of their transition to one semester to the other, but we we've, we've been talking um with 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 some UCSD folks and we may uh as soon as we get something that like is a achievable sort of semester long digital signal processing type of challenge on a on known hardware that's that's something that that people can you know have in in a lab or have access to then then we get a lot of traction from from the, from university students so you know yeah it's, this, like if you i could see i know you know professors saying like here's this thing go design this piece and that's your 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 term project or something right you know and if yeah. they do it right then it works and if they don't then it doesn't work right but it's just a piece of the overall system yes. that could be interesting yes. yeah so i think we're 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 definitely getting to the point where where we can describe problems and then then maybe make them uh achievable uh open source challenges um you know, yeah because i mean i think i think there's a lot of pieces now that plug into this that that could be done and they're yeah. and and, it, it, and they're more approachable i think at this point right uh, a differential encoder decoder lock detector although it's still kind of complicated and you know filtering that sort of thing there's there's a lot there that's that's smaller chunks that would be more approachable for right. for um to a wider you know people with a wider range of experience right yeah good stuff yeah, a lot of this, yeah, we we have a, a huge range from the very R to the very D for the R and D. So this is uh, that makes it that makes it great. So uh, let's see, let's uh, let's see if Rick has any comments or input or a review for the the repo or the model or 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 anything. Um, Got the floor, Rick. What do you think about the design? Got any advice for us or questions? I think you're on the right track. And your experiences are <clears throat> bring back memories of the high speed data project I did for Ron Paris at the US Naval Academy. And uh, <clears throat> I can tell you that the hardest part of that project was the clock recovery. <laughs> uh, we, and we didn't use FPGAs at the time. We were using hardware. 
and I finally had to wire wrap a board for nice. uh, to replace everything we had done and packed it in be with wires behind the rack. And all of a sudden, we were able to decode the signals. Uh, it wasn't the greatest uh, clock recovery circuit in the world, but at least we were recovering signals. So you're bringing back a lot of memories. FPGAs aren't a whole lot different than hardware. No, no. Just more integrated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and they give you this false sense that you can do a whole lot more than you used to be able to do because all those bits in there, you've got to turn them into pseudo hardware. And we've got to use lots more complex algorithms than we used to use when it was all PTL. But we ran into all the same problems. So uh, I think you're on the right track. All right, good to hear. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, wire wrapping. That's uh, good honest work right there. It was called desperation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lost art, I would say. Oh, no. I, oh, no, I still have all my wire wrapping stuff in those yellow bins. I, and I just, use it I just, Yeah, no, within the last year, I did, did I had to do a wire wrapping project. So it, it still pops up every now and then. It's what we're doing is sort of digital wire wrapping at this point. It's, it a, is. you know, yeah, <laughs> virtual wire wrapping. Right. It is. No, I'm very excited. Um, oh, yeah. So, any just from, from any, anybody, um, any last just, co comments or, or questions or things that we didn't get around to before we close? Yeah, I'll just make um, one comment. I'm, I'm closing in on, on getting the ILA working. So, I, I, I was able to, um, being away from home, I just happened to have my solder and iron with me, so I was able to um, put these tiny little headers on <laughs> Pluto, and uh, and the Zovato lab tool recognizes it, recognizes the FPGA, and says there's no ILA in here. I'm like, yeah, good. So, um, and I have my Windows box talking to the remote lab, so I was able to download the the build. So I just got to get it talking to the Pluto enough that I can, um, you know, up download the the firmware and um, get some software running so that um, it's doing something useful and then I can see if ILA is putting out anything. So we're close on that. I was hoping we'd have it done already, but maybe in the next couple of days um, we'll have a well, functional did, ILA approach. I did the same thing. I took my two Plutos and put those tiny little headers on them. And made sure all the cables plugged in and worked with Bravado. So I'm yeah. ready to load the code when you have working code. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, it's like my readers weren't cut cutting it for the um, those oh. you know, five pitch pins. So I, I had my uh, I, I, got, I put my um, iPhone on on a power brick and put oh, it over and, and it did great. <laughs> so I have a microscope. <laughs> yeah. It works much better. It does, yes. But the iPhone worked in a pinch, so that was made it made it possible. Right on. Yeah, thank goodness they added macro to the iPhone. Yeah. I waited years for that. Yeah, good deal. Right on. Okay. Any any last uh any last words before we close? All right. Well, we'll keep at uh, it, and uh, we'll be back here. Uh, oh, go ahead, Rick. No, can you stay for a moment? Oh yeah, yeah. I'll go ahead and and we'll close close our meeting and uh, and say that we're gonna uh, be back back here. I think. Let's see. I think from today would be. Oh well, getting getting close to Thanksgiving, but we'll still meet next week, and uh, you know, there's a. Uh, through the U.S. holiday, might take some days off here, but we'll keep at it. So uh, please drop by on Slack and and check out the the repository for the code. Um, and you know we're we're publishing uh, as many explanations as we can and trying to get the documentation to match what's actually going on and increase our understanding and spread that understanding around. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll be back next week and and until then, uh, meet up with us on Slack and. Please feel free to reach out to, to any of us uh, at ORI if you want to be part of this effort or if you have a similar project or, or know of something related to open source digital radio that you'd like to see 
uh, get some attention. Okay, so see everybody next week.